when the women that got in the workforce are now they don't get paid for what to, they do because they're women there and I don't care what sex they are what color they are if they do the work they should get paid for it but uh, uh, I don't know what what's going to happen on that there, but the women furnished us up with what we needed, and that's how we won the war because they did what we had to have, and they furnished us with it. That's a fascinating tidbit to share for a lot of people to understand how that was a major breakthrough out of tragedy to bring to bring women into more mainstream roles with men and the heroic and courageous efforts they did and uh, on that and. And now we got uh, women in the, on on the ships, sir. Commanding officers of the ships, they, they do everything. The jockeys, race drivers, they, everything here. Because up to that point, the women were second class, uh, class citizens. There, the men brought in the income, but they were gone. Mm -hmm. And so the women stepped in, did what they had to do. Now, when President Roosevelt um, asked for a declaration of war from Congress. He got it. I think there was only one dissenting one, vote. One, one, Jeanette Rankin, I believe. Yeah. And uh, But we also declared war on Germany because Germany had also declared war coinciding with the attack on Pearl Harbor. Is that correct? Uh, that, uh, Germany didn't want to get in the war with the United States because I think they're going back to what the, how the United States helped in World War, World War One. They didn't want to get the United States in the war. But then when J Japan took, uh, started the war, and uh, Japan was already uh, an ally of, of Germany, so then Germany declared war in the United States because up to that up to that time, our our ships were being sunk in the Atlantic because we were not in the war and they were not protected there, and as a result, there uh, when we stepped in, we got in the war. Our ships were being protected there, and Germany uh, didn't do weren't doing so good as they, what they were doing before. Because they were sinking all kinds of our ships, because we were they were not protected. Now, what were, what thoughts do you recall at that period of time yourself and uh, your colleagues? For us to go into a war then in Europe, Asia, the Atlantic, Pacific—that's a pretty big undertaking. Yeah. Did you have doubts about our capability to do something like that? Well, when you think back about uh, how we helped out in the wor World War One, it. Uh, uh, we had to do something because some of our people, even before we got in the war, some of our pilots were joined the RAF, Royal Air Force, they're flying with it. Some were with the Flying Tigers in the Pacific with General Chenault there. Some of our people wanted to help, even though we were not not in the war. So some of the people were for it, and, and a lot of people were against it. And the, our big wheels in, uh, in Washington there kept us out of the war until Pearl Harbor, and then we had to get in the war. Mm -hmm. Now, the ship you were on, the USS Pennsylvania, was damaged. It was in dry dock. There were casualties. What happened to the ship uh, after Pearl Harbor? Did it had, had to go under undergo repairs? And we had although we only had that one one hit at Pearl Harbor, that five hundred pound bomb. It did not hurt our watertight integrity. It's less than two weeks. We we're on our way back to San Francisco, get patched up, get new guns there, and get ready for fight, fighting the war. We were an old battleship built built in nine. I think it's commissioned in 1916. There, we do about 15 knots downhill with a tailwind. We didn't have we didn't have the speed it had, so all we could do is help them with fire support, which we did there for during the war. So the Pennsylvania, under its own power, went back to San Francisco to was it uh, Hunter Yard uh, uh, to undergo repairs? Well, we went to Hunter's Hunter's Point. Hunter's Point. Uh, yeah. is where the overhaul place because there's dry docks also there. So we were in Hunter's Point and uh, and I think we ended up at, at Bethlehem Steel getting a, uh, new guns and right. uh, to get ready to fight a war. And then we started training there and get ready because okay. war is on. Okay, and, and with that, Mickey, we're going to take a, a brief pause here for a public service announcement. It appears these hot ashes are about to be dumped, which could possibly start a wildfire. How will Smokey deal with such a hot situation? The garden hose defense. Next, a thorough stir. Then, another spray. And finally, feeling if the ashes are cool. Oh, yeah. Ah, yes, the selfie. A ritual practiced so frequently with this tribe, but not so much by Smokey Bear. Only you can prevent wildfires.
Got a corner. Welcome back to Interesting People. My name is Tom Lorenzen, the host of this show. My guest today is Mr. Mickey Ganich, a veteran of Pearl Harbor from December 7th, 1941, 75 years ago this year. He was on the board of the, uh, on board of the USS Pennsylvania, one of eight battleships in Pearl Harbor at that time, and it was in dry dock. And I'm going to hold up a photograph here for you, Mickey, and Tell us a little bit about the ship and where you were mm -hmm. at the time of the attack. My living compartment of quartermaster, which I was, is back way back here. My battle station is up here in the crow's nest, way up the top. That was my, my battle station there. A bomb, it, it, in the second attack, a bomb came in past me, went through two decks and exploded. Way down here, if it exploded on contact, I wouldn't be here talking either. It's kind of scary to see this big hole along alongside of it. When the bomb hits, 500-pound bomb hits there, it, it, it expands quite a quite a bit. It's pretty, maybe this big here to start with there, but it's the area there that covers there is pr pretty bad. But we lost 23 men yeah. that particular Now, Mickey, you said this battleship was built in 1915, 19, 16? 1915, I think it's commissioned 1916. Because it looks very uh, contemporary. <laughs> That was a that must have been a state of the art ship. Yeah. Well, we it was pretty good. Six hundred and eight feet long, there, thirty three thousand ton. There, it's pretty formidable. Well, no wonder the Japanese wanted to take out the uh, battleships. Oh, yeah. Because up, up to that time, the strength of the Navy was battleships, and we had eight of them. Of course, we were the newer, the newer ones were the California, the Maryland, the Tennessee, and West Virginia. They were the they were the new ones there. Arizona, Oklahoma, and Nevada, and us were the oldest battleships there. We had uh, we had 14-inch uh, guns. The newer battleships had 16-inch guns on them. Now, I understand that Nevada got underway and tried to get out of the harbor. Yeah, that was a disaster. I think that would have that would have been if uh, they would have been uh, sunk in the middle in the channel. Nobody would have been able to get in or out there. That was foolish. What was one ship going to do? <laughs> against a, a Japanese fleet. Right. Of course, they didn't know how many people would be yeah. out there, but it, it's, it sounds real good that they got underway and they'd see what they could do. But it would have been a disaster. I think it had been crazy, because once the Japanese saw that the ship was heading for the channel, they had bombs going, or torpedoes going, anything, and sink it in the channel, or they wanted to sink it. But sure. they, uh, the crew of the... USS Nevada saw what was going, so they beached it. They run to the ground there oh, before it could get out in the channel where it'd be sunk, where it, nobody would have got out. That was been, it would have been a disaster. Yeah, I can see that. So with the Pennsylvania, you came back to San Francisco. The ship was went under repairs at Hunter's Point with Bethlehem Steel. And then you spend the next three and a half years in the Pacific. On the well, we... Uh, the, the first time, first thing we had, uh, uh, which really helped us, sir, was Jimmy Jimmy Doolittle. They'd, the morale of the United States was very bad because Japan had been run all over the Pacific, and Germany was taking over so much of the of Europe. Uh, the morale of the United States was really bad, and they decided they better do something. They found a man by the name of Jimmy Doolittle. He was a uh, Air, Air Force, at that time, his Army Air Corps, there was no Air Force, later on there was the Air Force, but his Army Air Corps, and he devised a plan that they would attack Japan. They would be on an aircraft carrier, 16 bombers on an aircraft carrier, they would get close to Japan, bomb Japan, and then continue on to China where fields were prepared for them. It was a great plan there. They were detected early, so they had to take off early. But think about airfield, how big an airfield they are, is, and think about bombers that have to take off of an aircraft carrier. It's a Hornet there, and though not the one that sell me to now. Mm -hmm. It's the one that they had before in, in World, War, World War II. And 
think about what they had to do to take off for the short distance. They unloaded everything they could except a few bombs that they had to make it as light as possible there too because they needed to get as far as they could. They didn't do much damage, but they did two things. Japan saw that they were attacked there, so they pulled a lot of their troops, a lot of their ships back to the mainland there in case they were invaded. Secondly, it helped the morale of the United States. We were doing something. We were fighting, fighting back here. So it did those two things. Then two months later, we had what they called the turning point of the war. They had a battle midway. Japan figured there that they weren't able to get the United States to surrender by taking the you know, Hawaiian Islands. So they tried to get midway. They figured if they could get midway island, they'd have a stepping stone. They could bomb Hawaiian Islands, and we would give up. But the way it was, they, they were detected. Ships were sunk. A lot of their good pilots were sunk. That's what they called the turning point of the turning point of the war. Because from then on, we were fighting back here. We're now was the Pennsylvania in the Battle of Midway? No, we were a backstop. We were in between uh, 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 Midway and San Francisco. I, I think it was quite a ways there because we were so slow. We really, they, we kind of be the last resort, I think, there. If if they got past the people at Midway, then uh, I don't think we would have much, been much of a problem because we were so, so, so slow. But uh, we, were, we were there, and we didn't find this out until later. In fact, we didn't even know about the Battle of Midway and, until after it's already gone. But that was a turning point there, and um, from then on we started fighting back, and my ship was used for fire support. Since we were so old there, and used it for fire support, the first thing that my ship had to do in, the, in World War II was the an invasion of Attu Islands, which is the westernmost part of the Aleutian Islands. Mm -hmm. Then we bombed Attu, uh, after Attu we, uh, we bombed Kiska because uh, Japan had already taken Kisco, already, which is on the mainland, almost on the mainland of the uh, Alaska. We bombed it, planes uh, bombed it also. All we found is one dog. <laughs> Japan had left there. Evidently, they saw the handwriting on the wall, and as a result there, they pulled the troops out. There was no nobody there except the dog. I'm not sure whether it's a friendly dog or not there, but that all the was left. So then my ship was used in the invasion of Macon Island, Kwajalein, Anahuitak, Palu, Saipan, Guam, and the Philippines there. All those were fire support for uh, not shooting at any ships there. It's just for fire support for those various invasions. Uh, we was doing our part, but we were too slow to keep up with aircraft carriers and cruisers there. So, but fire support was our specialty, and we were good. We were good. I'm sure you were, Mickey. <laughs> I had a chance to visit uh, Guam several times and Saipan and listen to the stories of people there that, uh, like yourself, a first-hand story or the stories of sons and daughters of their parents. And those were pretty, pretty heavy battles uh, there in the Pacific. And uh, so uh, with, with that, too, with the battleships being the core of the Navy in 1941, hence the attack to first try and take out all the battleships. Was there a transition then during the course of the war to aircraft carriers? Yeah, definitely, because right from then, that point on, aircraft carriers were the, were the thing. In fact, the USS Enterprise, if one for the USS Enterprise there, I, I don't think we had any success at all because Enterprise was about the only ship that could uh, stay in decent shape or Every time a Saratoga would get uh, out there, it'd get damaged there, and it'd send it back for some place for repairs. Or so USS Enterprise and the Lexington, especially the Enterprise, were the aircraft carriers that were used and really helped tide us over there and until we was able to build new aircraft carriers and help them out. Mm -hmm. How did uh, you and others feel about the uh, performance, the quality of the Japanese Navy that you're going into combat with, uh, were they comparable to us? They were faster. They faster. were. They were. They were faster ships. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know how it ended up there because we found out later they were much faster ships than, than we were, and as a result there, it would have been pretty disastrous there if, uh, uh, in an open battle, I think, to start with. Later on, it, it's all right because, but uh, once we got to some newer battleships there, but up to that time there, the Japanese ships were much faster. But once, once they were lost there, they weren't be able to be uh, replaced like we were able to replace our losses. Mm -hmm. Well, you're on the Pennsylvania, the Pacific Ocean, engaged in the Pacific War. What awareness did you and others have of the war in, the, on, in Europe and at the North Atlantic? And were you informed of what was going on? Or were you? We would get a word there because there's communications there that would come out and each ship had communication so the people, their crew, would get the word on any anything that was uh, coming on. We knew about everything except the atomic bomb. There, we nobody knew about that till actually, actually it happened. There, sure. it's quite a secret. What at, at any point during the war did you have doubts about the ability of the United States and the Allies to prevail in the war in the Pacific, the war in the Atlantic, Europe, Asia? Were there was there periods of doubts? There was doubt until we started, still we started fighting back, till we started taking back some of the islands that they'd taken. Then that gave us confidence, and they knew that we were on the on the right way, right track here, and so that really helped our morale because we needed to pick up too, and just uh, Jimmy Doolittle and his group bombing uh, Japan, and then the turning point in the war, the Battle of Midway, that was like a uh, shot in the arm there that really helped because the morale knew that we were on the right way. We're going to do it. It seems to me that I read at one point that uh, the Battle of Midway became through a tip through intelligence over a water tower. Yes, or we something. were we were very for we were very fortunate there, and uh, due to the facts there that they, they uh, Japan didn't know whether we had. Uh, Planes from aircraft carrier or land boys land, they start juggling back and forth torpedoes or bombs and back and forth there, and they delayed them there, able to get planes off, and it, as a result, that helped us and was able to sink their, their aircraft carriers there. Due to the fact there that uh, uh, they were confused on uh, whether uh, they should be careful for uh, land based planes or to, uh, aircraft carriers or what, they, they, they didn't know what to expect, and that helped us. When names like uh, Bull Halsey and Admiral Nimitz come up, what what thoughts do you have looking back on? They were they were great, especially when Admiral Nimitz came, uh, came to Hawaii after the attack on uh, uh, Pearl Harbor there, and it, it, he had confidence. He had confidence. He just he came on my I saw him on our on our ship. I didn't never spoke to him, but he came on our ship there, and it just seemed like he had uh, he knew what to do there and. He was going to get it done there, just uh, like a, another, another John Wayne. He, he's he's going to do it, and he showed us how, and uh, I, he directed us there, and uh, I take pride in knowing that he was on our side. Hmm. That's, it's nice to hear. As uh, the war is going on, and the war ends in Europe, and then we're preparing for an invasion of Japan. Were you part of the preparations, you know, the Pennsylvania, for that invasion? Uh, was there, uh, after the, in fact, let me mention about, uh, uh, so my ship was in the first, uh, you might as well call it the first invasion in, in the Philippines there. Mm -hmm. And my ships, they had troops all land, uh, landed all, already on, on Lady itself. And a lot of our ships were in port steaming around the, furnishing them with supplies or whatever they needed, all kinds of ships in the harbor. We got the word this Japanese fleet coming up from the south there through Surigao Strait in the southern part of the Philippines coming up up that way. The six of us old battleships were up up there, and we got the, we got the word on them, and we waited for them. That's what they call crossing the T. Six of us battleships are going back and forth there, and this Japanese fleet coming up there. The ships were all in line. They, they couldn't spread out at all. The only ship that could shoot at us was the lead ship. That's what they call the tactician's dream, crossing the T there. So when they got within range, wow. we, we wiped out the whole, whole fleet there. 
but then was after that was an in, invasion of well let, let me mention about uh, uh there in lady golf that that day that after we crossed uh, before we crossed the t by that time japanese uh, were getting desperate they started something called kamikaze planes planes pilots were trained to take off, don't worry about the landing because most of them were not going to come back. We're steaming around there in Lady Golf itself, and we got the word there that uh, uh, watch out for kamikaze planes. Now, at that time, my battle station was steering at 33,000 uh, battleships. Yeah. I'm steering at 33,000 ton battleship. We got the word there. Kamikaze plane hit a destroyer, the Abner Reed, over in that area. Captain says, hard right rudder, steer for that torpedo, give it as small a target as possible. Now, a ship doesn't turn like a car. A car goes right around the corner. ship kind of goes around like this. And I look, I watch the wake from a torpedo coming, coming, and I can see it through the porthole. Everybody hold on. I got to hold on the bar over here. Got the rudder over hard as I can. Hold on, hold on. Hold. It went right underneath it. Evidently, <laughs> there, when the torpedo went off, uh, it went. It was tilted a little bit. It went a little bit deeper. There, that kind of gives you a thrill. <laughs> <laughs> well, seventy-five years later, I can see why it's giving me a thrill hearing that but story. After we got through it, uh, <laughs> the Philippines there, our guns would not shoot straight. It sent us back to the states, back to Bethlehem Steel, get the new new guns. In the meantime, they have an invasion of Iwo Jima and Okinawa. That's the last step before the invasion of Japan. We went back to the States there to uh, get new guns and came back the latter part of July. We're coming back there to Okinawa where the ships are going to assemble. By that time, uh, which was two months later there, about two months later there, uh, we're on our way back to Japan get ready for the invasion. And at that point, Mickey, we're going to take a brief pause here for a public service announcement and come back for the final 15 minutes of our conversation today. Okay. So there you are, shuffling through a stack of resumes and you come to mind. This is it. First impression. My way in. But can my resume show you how I truly stand out? Like that I was studying, going to night school while working two jobs just to help my parents pay for groceries, or being the first one to always step up. No, that's something you just can't put on paper. Look beyond the resume and discover new ways to develop great talent that is dedicated, hardworking, and determined like me. Welcome back to Interesting People. My name's Tom Lorenzen, the host of this show. This is filmed here at Chabot College in Hayward, California. My guest today has been Mr. Mick, Mickey Ganich, a veteran of Pearl Harbor, of the attack of the Day of Infamy 75 years ago this December, on December 7th, 1941. Uh, Mickey was just explaining to us about the preparations to get ready for the invasion of Japan. And uh, so you're on the USS Pennsylvania, you're part of the whole gathering. What were you being told? What, what was to be expected? For a pending invasion, and then what changed that whole equation? Get ready for the get ready for the invasion of Japan, which was very bad by that time. Iwo Jima and Okinawa were already settled. The next step was the invasion of Japan. We're steaming back to Okinawa, where the ships are all congregated. Something happened there, on August sixth, nineteen forty-five. This is nineteen forty-five now. They dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. It's a complete surprise to us. Nobody knew about any kind of bomb or they even thought about any kind of bomb. Enough of explosion. I also took some photographs with my private camera. Three days later, August 9th, they dropped the atomic bomb on Nagasaki. Three days later, August 12th, we got into ok Okinawa. All the other ships were already in there, getting making preparations for the invasion of Japan, which was going to be in October, September, and October in in that very various in that uh, time. That night, eight thirty that night, Japanese plane command with the lights on. Nobody fired a shot at. Aimed its torpedo at the um, first ship it saw. Well, you hold up the uh, battleship. This is the ship. The ship. Oh, this one here. Yeah. 
It aimed its torpedo at the closest big ship of the battleship Pennsylvania. It hit the torpedo hit back back here by the pro uh, propellers. Now the living compartment of the quartermasters was back there. I had 26 quartermasters. I lost 20 of them that night. Next morning, the Japanese asked for peace. We're the last big ship in World War II. They told us in the shallow ground there at Okinawa, in case we sink, we'd just sink in the mud there. But we're able to stay afloat. Meantime, they're getting ready to sign a peace treaty in Tokyo Bay. They told us to go on, put us in a dry dock. We're just partially in the dry dock there because we're 608 feet long. Put us in dry dock in the meantime there. They already signed the peace treaty in Tokyo Bay. The war is over. They sent us back to the States there, the Bremen and Washington there, on their own par, by ourselves. When the torpedo hit us, it wiped out the propellers on the right-hand side because the ship has four propellers, two on each side there in the back. One on the left was pretty good, one was not so good. Well, we, we started back to the States there, Bremen and Washington there. We started having problems with the propeller. It stopped the ship, put divers over the side, because all big ships have deep sea drivers. Put divers over the side, see what they can do with that propeller. Meantime, sharks come around the ship here. We pull the divers back out of the water, put boats in the water with the Marines, because all big ships have Marines on them. They kept the sharks away from the divers so they could work on the propellers. We came back to our own, on their own power to get back to the States there. We came to Bremerton, and Washington. Now it's, now it's 1946. Now they want to have it. They already saw what damage there, the atomic bomb would have Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Now they want to see what damage it have on ships. Now our, our ship was already damaged there. We had a skeleton crew because of the war, war is over. So they sent us out to Bikini Atoll, which is west of the U of Hawaiian Islands there, with all kinds of ships. They had Japanese ships, German ships, Dutch ships, British ships, all kinds of variety of ships because they wanted to find out what damage it would have, the atomic bomb would have on ships. Now it put us in the atoll itself there at Bikini, took us off the ship there. We anchored it and left it in there. We got off the ship about 10 miles away on another ship. They said, make sure you close your eyes, look away from the air blast, because the air blast is going to be first. Close your eyes, put your hands, your eyes over your arm. I still saw the flash. Uh -huh. Now they want to find out what damage it'd have on animals. Now I'm a farm boy from Ohio there, so they put me in charge of animals, the goats, mice, pigs, and sheep. Put me in charge of these animals, put them out throughout the ship. Now, we spread the ships out, put the atomic bomb right in the, the center, uh, underwater blast, and put us off in another ship. Now we could watch this because it's like a tsunami there, the wall of water coming up there. USS Saratoga aircraft carrier was one of them there. It's practically standing on his, standing on his tail there. So we could watch that blast. And now I'd go back on the ship, show them where I put all the animals. Oh, they said, uh, your clothes will be radioactive here. Throw away your clothes and take a good shower. That's a protection head. Must not affect me too much because I got 13 grandchildren, 18 great-grandchildren, <laughs> and eight great-great-grandchildren here. I'm a bionic man. I just don't have a $6 million to go with it. Well, that's a protection I had. <laughs> well, without any doubt, I know you're a man of vitality, Mickey. <laughs> but uh, one thing I did, I, I enlisted in the post office in Oakland, January 21st of 1941. And uh, my Navy career, the Navy recruiting office in the post office in Oakland, October 10th of 1963. <laughs> I ended up in the same place I started with. I thought that was really something. <laughs> you brought these photographs. What intrigued me, I'm going to hold one up here. This is General, what, explain the, the, who's the, in the photograph. This is General MacArthur signing the peace treaty there on the USS uh, Missouri in Tokyo Bay, September 2nd, 1945. The second pen to British General Percival, commander at the surrender of Singapore. MacArthur uses six pens in all, affixing what will be the most important signature in Japan to the document that ends permanently that nation's regime of terror and aggression. This is 
is skinny General Wainwright, the one that he left the baton in, in Krigador. See how skinny he is? He, he, the fact, he nothing, nothing to him. He's, he's tall, but he's skinny. He's, he was in baton death march and all march, marched all. And that's General Percival in, in behind him uh, uh, of a Brit British people. Now, in the background of the officers on the USS uh, Missouri, not a one of them with a necktie, not a ribbon, no nothing. General MacArthur said, we work to get this far. We will be in a working uniform. We signed a peace treaty. Now, let's see the other one there. See the one that... Uh, now, this is a Japanese delegation, one that signed, that signed the peace treaty. You see him with top hats there and ribbons and medals and stuff like that. What a contrast there from what way we looked at. But General MacArthur really sh showed up the Japanese because they go much for that dignity and all that. And so it was kind of a, uh, insulting to the uh, Japanese that we'd be in a working uniform, we'd sign the peace treaty. But that's, a, that's the way it turned out like that. And I find that quite interesting because uh, General MacArthur was known as a man of strong ego, yeah, strong yeah. presence, oh, yeah. etc. But yet he had all the military people Dressed in simple uniforms, no medals, no ties, and the simplest, the simplest. He did it on purpose, I think. That's what I. That's what I hear. He did it on purpose there, just to show up the Japanese there, just for they're the they're the ones that attacked us there, and we won we won the war, and that's. Uh, hmm. I think that's. Uh, I'm not sure what you call the affront against the Japanese or what whatever, but that's why they were dressed like that. Interesting. Well, Mickey, we've got about uh, six more minutes to go in this interview. I want to uh, now. You were you have you were just getting ready to turn what age now? Well, in I might ask. In, in November will be the anniversary of my forty-eight and a half birthday. I will be ninety-seven years old. Ninety-seven in, years in November old. November eighteen. And you've got <laughs> such an ebullience to you, you well, such vitality. I found the secret long life, which really makes a difference. Keep breathing, because <laughs> the alternative isn't so good. Yeah, no, I can. Put... Now you were from uh, Ohio originally. Yes, Ohio, a small town or small town, twenty-one population. I think twenty-one hundred population. I think that's counting the cats and dogs too. Okay, but uh, I came to California in nineteen thirty-nine because. Uh, jobs were very scarce back in Ohio because as after the depression, in fact, I worked on WPA, which is a work progress administration there, one of the jobs that uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt created there d during the depression there, and that helped out. But that's the only job available. And uh, I had a brother and sister already living in Cal California there, and they said, come on out there and uh, to California there, and uh, we'll see if we can get you a job there, which they did. But I worked there, but... Uh, do the unrest and you in fact you can really call me a draft dodger because <laughs> in 19, 1940 the fall of 1940 every man 21 years and old had to register for the draft and going into the army now they said if you're going some of the people that i knew said if you go in the army you may be sleeping outside and get cold food and all that so i joined the navy <laughs> so do you call me a draft dodger right because i wasn't 21 but i would be in a couple of months and uh, the next next draft was going to be in the spring of 1941. So I joined the Navy instead. I think you're a pretty wise man. No <laughs> affront to the people of the U.S. Army. I think you're a pretty wise decision. Now, in in the years that have followed, you have become a major spokesperson for the event at Pearl Harbor, the world, the war in the Pacific in particular. You, Tell us about, you speak before uh, all kinds of clubs and schools. I talk, I talk to schools, club, I mean, had, I talk to uh, elementary schools, uh, uh, middle schools, high schools, colleges, clubs, anyone who wants to listen to me there. And uh, <laughs> I, I talk there, and now that I have a PowerPoint, I use PowerPoint in my talks, and I average between 30 and 35 speaking engagements a year. I've had as many as six speaking engagements in one day. I can understand And, uh, of course, I kind of run on remote control by the end of the day, though. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm proud that I can uh, talk, especially the kids. I appreciate talking to the kids there because one of the things I emphasize there, the, the kids need to be accountable for their own action. Not Don't depend on their parents or their relatives to bail them out. Learn by experience there. But learn by, if you make a mistake, don't be afraid to admit it. Be accountable for your own actions there. Learn 
and you'll be a better person, and the country will be a better person that you, you uh, think that way and, and act that way. So I think that's the biggest problem there, and nowadays with all this political stuff, and uh, this has to be politically correct and all that kind of stuff, I get tired of this kind of stuff. Because uh, uh, my wife's a registered Republican, I'm a registered Democrat, we haven't voted for a particular party for the last 15, 20 years there, and I've, we've been married 53 years, and maybe that's why we get along. We vote for who we want. We don't care what party they're in. That's great. Now, you were uh, at Pearl Harbor for the 50th anniversary in 1991, yeah. and you're going back this December for the 75th anniversary. Yeah. What thoughts are on your mind as you prepare to go back to Pearl Harbor 75 years later? Well, it brings back memories there, and... Uh, uh, they said, how can you do that? I said, you can't change what happened there. And I think about the future. We had our uh, enemies there. Japan was our enemies once. Now the, uh, our be one of our best friends there. You can't change uh, change what what happened there. Think think about the future. It's like in the movies there, break a leg or something like that. The show goes on there. It's, to me, it's like a game, football game, especially because that's one of my main sports there is football. But uh, you're maybe enemies on a field. Maybe you go out to supper together there. You you aren't going to change what happened. Think about the future. That's what I, what I do. And in fact, in fact, my, they said, how can you even associate with the Japanese? Well, my wife has a, uh, drives a Japanese car there. So, uh, so uh, think about the future. Well, in, in thinking about the future, as you're getting ready to turn 97, go to Pearl Harbor on the 75th anniversary of the attack, and you were there. What do you think of the future? What do you tell young people when you're out uh, giving talks in schools and having conversations the with them? The main, main thing there is be accountable for your action. I think that's so more important to the, to, uh, to the kids there, to uh, be accountable for their, their own actions. So don't be afraid to make a mistake. When the, the, all these inventions, I tell me all these inventions are made, you, you, they didn't, uh, when they invent something, they didn't do it to fir on the first lick. Maybe they, it took them several times before they perfected it all that. So if you make a mistake, next time maybe you won't make a mistake. Uh, mm -hmm. But the main thing is for the kids there uh, to be accountable for their own actions there. Uh. Well, Mickey, as we bring this uh, conversation to a close here, uh, I'd like to take the liberty to uh, say how exceptional it is uh, to have an opportunity to sit down and visit with you. Uh, I think it's a unique privilege for me. It's a privilege for the people who watch this program. You have shown us the best of what I think this country is about. You're dedicated to the country. You're dedicated to the future. You understand the past. And you're optimistic. You look at young people. You give them good advice. And I think that uh, it's been one of the great privileges of my life to have you on this show today. I was helped so many times while I was in the service. I dedicated myself to help others. Right right now, I'm chaplain of the Fleet Reserve. I'm chaplain of the American Legion. I'm chaplain of Veteran Forts. I'm chaplain of the Masons. I'm adjutant treasurer for disabled American veterans. I'm a head usher of my church. I've been head usher of my church for 50 years. I think it's a permanent job because the guy before me died. I'm a volunteer at the VA clinic in Oakland. I got over 7,000 hours volunteering. I take veterans to their appointments, whatever they are. I have my own car. I get, I get around there and uh, I'll always keep in mind there the secret of long life to keep breathing. <laughs> well, Mickey, uh, you're an American treasure. And it's been my privilege to have you on the show today. And thank you for everything you've done with your life and for so many people. I just happened to be there. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so glad you're here today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mickey. Thank you. Right Thank now. you.